I mean, it wasn't like this even eight, nine, ten years ago. I'm not sure we had this track at that point. So uh, I'm really excited to see so many people here and ready to go and, and follow promotion. Um, this has been a really valuable contribution to our school to have the non tenure track promotion process uh, because it re really recognizes the contributions and achievements of our clinicians and our educators. The, uh, and it's been highly successful. We've had a lot of people go through this process and, and, we've, and they've all been successful going through. And now, of course, in the last few years, we everyone who gets through and gets promoted gets a raise, an automatic raise with us. So that's also a nice little contribution to it. The other thing that's important to remember about this and why I'm so gratified to see so many people is that rank holds currency on campus and, and in academia. People notice when you are an associate or a professor and, and whether you're tenure track or not tenure track, that rank is important. So I'm glad to see you all here thinking about moving up in, in terms of rank because that, that has merit on campus and that will benefit you and, and the school as well. Uh, so then I'm going to say one more quick thing about that, and then, okay, maybe three, three more things. Um, <laughs> so because this is a new process, we haven't always had the same level of formality around the protocol that we've had for other processes, but, but this is an important one. It carries with it a responsibility to do it right, to follow the policy. I think in the future what we're going to see on campus at MU as well as in our school is, is more attention paid to the requirements of the dossier and to the deadlines that in which each component needs to be submitted. There's been a little lax in that. Uh, that's probably not going to happen in the future. So, so be aware of that. Not only uh, the candidates, you need to be aware of it, but if you're on a committee, you need to be aware of it. You need to get your committee going and get it done. Because you can't, if you're late, if you're two weeks late in your review and then pushing it off, well, you may make the next person miss the deadline, and then the candidate may not even be able to go up. So, so it's up to the committee, it's up to the chair, it's up to me that we all hit our deadlines, we all get the processes right, and, and send them forward. You're going to have a panel here that's going to tell you uh, some good things about how to make these dossiers work and how to make the review process work well. And this is probably not my place to do it, but I have thoughts and so I'm going to share them with you because here I am, I'm standing and, and you're all looking at me, so I get this opportunity. Um, when you're assembling your dossier, remember data is important. It's not just about narrative. Uh, and in fact, most of the dossiers I see probably use a bit more concision tends to be that people think they just put more in that it looks better. Well, a bigger dossier isn't necessarily a better dossier. So be precise, be specific, be concise, and don't repeat things. Um, and then finally, be careful about adding on extra. So if the, if the dossier doesn't require something, like extra letters from students and so forth, you don't really need to have them. In fact, you probably should be careful about adding them in. So, if it doesn't ask for letters from students and you put one in, it may or may not add much. In fact, letters from students tend to be, now they all tend to say the same thing. This professor was really important to me and guided my career, blah, blah, And it says, all of them, I'm telling you, all of them say the same thing. Uh, and so they really say nothing in, in the end. Uh, so if you have, you want to add those extras, make sure that it adds a unique contribution to the contents of the dossier. So it says something about you that wouldn't be apparent from other components of it. Uh, so that's the only pieces of advice that I have. Uh, so other, other than that, uh, the last piece of advice is get ready, go for it, get yourself promoted. It's really a good step in your career and it could be beneficial not just to, to you but, but to the school. And, and you have our support, you have this panel support. Uh, some of them may or may not be on the committees, but you certainly have mine and you have your chair. So I'm hopeful that all of you will be going to promotion in the very near future. Not all this year, because I don't have time to write all the letters, but, but very soon. Okay, questions for me and then I'll get out of the way. Uh, I'm here and Nicole is here to be a resource for you all. So if you have questions along the way, um, I'm happy to uh, try to answer them.
So that's what this workshop is intended to do as well, is to hopefully help answer some questions. Um, I'm going to put the PowerPoint on our intranet, and so you'll see as I go through the slides, there's going to be some links on there and some other resources. So I put them there not because I think I'm going to go through them all right now, but just because I want you to have them uh, if you need them uh, in the future. So, and then we also are recording this, so if you have colleagues who wanted to come today and weren't able to come, we're going to find a way to make the video available to them as well, so, uh, so just so you know. Um, to give you a sense of what we're doing here today, so I'm going to go through and give you an overview of the promotion process. Uh, and then I've asked these folks to help out. Uh, so Kyle's going to talk from the department chair perspective, which is really critical uh, in several aspects of the promotion process. And then we have Julie and Mark who are going to help from the um, SHP promotion committee point of view because they've served on that. So uh, I'll go through and start talking through some information, but if you all want to jump in with questions, uh, we also have Judith this year as another department chair, so uh, and if you all want to jump in and share your thoughts as we go, uh, that would probably be better. So if you have questions or things you want to talk about along the way, definitely interrupt me. Um, you know, one thing to think about uh, with the whole promotion process, uh, although people sometimes get very anxious about the dossier, uh, really all of the hard work has been done well before you're getting your dossier together, and it's going to continue well after you get your dossier done. So the hard work related to getting promoted is the work that you guys do every day. Uh, it's not the dossier. So don't let getting the dossier together um, prevent you from getting recognition for the work that you're already doing. So just as an overview, keep that in mind. Okay. Chris alluded to this already. Um, I'm interested, I'm always interested in kind of knowing where we've been and uh, what that means for what we're doing. It is interesting to me that before 2004, there really wasn't a process for promoting non-tenure track faculty on this campus. Uh, I think promotion could occur within a specific unit, uh, but it wasn't until 2004 that the, there was a review process where dossiers went out to the provost, uh, and then 2006 where there were actual guidelines set up. Uh, and what this also tells me, and I, I think Chris alluded to this as well, is that we are not perfect in how we go through this process. And so um, if some of you feel like it's not clear what needs to be done, I think that's probably because campus and we are also still kind of perfecting what it is that needs to be done along the way. Okay. Um, so there have been some conversations recently about the different titles for non-tenure track faculty. Uh, and so we have three options here. This is... And you'll find um, these materials come from our School of Health Professions faculty policy and also the University of Missouri policy manual. So in any case, but according to SHP, we've got these three academic titles. Um, you can see the way the clinical title was written. It pretty much includes just about everything. <laughs> so uh, so um, faculty who are doing primarily classroom teaching may have a clinical title. Um, you know, I think if you have questions about whether your title is appropriate for your work, I would encourage you to talk with your department chair. Uh, we've gotten information from the provost office that they're comfortable with us uh, kind of determining what faculty titles should be. So, um, but if you have questions about your title, what is consistent with what it is that you see your role as, then just talk to your department chair. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So this is the, one of the slides I was referring to. So this is just for your reference uh, if you go and get this PowerPoint later. Um, these are the places where you can find the guidelines for the promotion process. Um, so definitely do refer to those. Um, we have the provost office guidelines. There's UM system guidelines. Um, we also have our faculty policy manual, which is on the intranet. Uh, if you guys haven't um, looked at that, it actually, it's a pretty useful resource. Um, we have our dossier submission timeline. I put a couple um, asterisks by that because the provost office has indicated that they're going to change their um, final deadline for when they want to receive it. I'll go through that in just a minute. So our current um, timeline will probably need to be modified. So just keep that in mind. 
Um, and then there are also departmental promotion guidelines for actually just a couple of departments. Um, these are not required, and so if your department does not have them, uh, that's okay. Um, but uh, you probably want to check with your department chair and see if there are departmental guidelines because that would help you as well. Okay. Good so far? All right. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Never mind. Thank you. I should let you ask the question. Okay. So, um, so you can see from the slide uh, our current timeline, and then the next column is the timeline that I um, have proposed. Actually, I sent it to the um, the promotion committee. Now, the way our faculty policy goes. Changes to our policy manual have to come from faculty or from an appropriate committee. So I could propose this change, but I'm not sure if that's the best way to go. So I kind of made a recommendation to the committee for the committee to think about. Um, what has happened essentially is that within our school, we had set March 15th as the deadline to go to the provost office. Now the provost is saying they want the dossiers by March 1st. Uh, and so um, the deadline for people turning in their dossiers does not change. What I ended up doing was kind of squeezing a little bit the length of time that the committees would have to review. Uh, so, um, but even, I don't, in any case, if you're thinking about submitting your dossier for this coming year, you're probably looking at a September deadline, somewhere in September. Do you guys have questions or thoughts about this? I think there's about, I'm trying to see, you know who actually gets squeezed the most on this is the department chairs. Yeah, I don't know how you all feel about that. Yeah, it sort of seemed like that was the group. The committees can be the hardest ones to get things done, but where it's just one person to review, I thought we could maybe squeeze the time there. So anyways, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but you can see, and I'll go through and talk about kind of what happens at each step, but so here's, the, here's the timeline to keep in mind. Okay, uh, so who's, evaluate, who's evaluating your dossier? So this, I think, is really important um, because, you know, like with anything that we write, you really want to think about who your audience is when you're writing it. And so we'll go through the parts of the dossier, and there are some narratives that you'll include, and they're very important. Um, and you want to think about who it is that's going to be reading this narrative, uh, and so what's going to be the best way to, keep, to communicate about what it is that you do so that they'll understand it. Because it's not just going to be people in your department; it'll be people in, you know, with a range of with a range of um, areas of expertise. So uh, we do have for the non-tenure track promotion, we do um, ask for peer letters. So you will have peers doing reviews, peer evaluations. Um, external letters in our school are optional. Um, so and that's you might want to consult with your department chair about what's re recommended from within your department, but they're optional. Um, I think most of the dossiers I've seen do not have external review letters for the non tenure track. I don't know which you guys have noticed. Dossiers, do they typically have external letters? I've never seen one. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but if you feel like you have somebody who would write you an outstanding letter and knows something about what you do that's different than your peers know, uh, that could be useful for you. So think about that. Um, within SHP, there is a departmental committee on review. So that's going to include three people within your department. Um, or if you don't have three people who are at the associate level or above, which I think we should all have that in all of our departments. But if that was the case, uh, then your departmental review committee could have people from other departments also. Uh, and then it goes from the department committee on review to the department chair. Uh, from the department chair to the SHP promotion committee, so Julie and Mark and their group. Uh, and then from the promotion committee on to the dean. So, and in each of these letter, in each of these levels, um, the department committee on review, the department chair, and the school committee and the dean, they all write letters. Uh, they all write an evaluation of your dossier. So just keep that in mind. And then the last step is going to the provost office. Yeah. Like peer, <clears throat> peer evaluations, who is a peer? Within the department, within the School of Health Professions, or campus-wide, or? Right. 
So I think a peer can be campus-wide. So it, it ideally would be a faculty member who can evaluate your work. Um, for people who have um, primarily teaching responsibilities, those can be you know, peer reviews of teaching activities. Um, but it doesn't, you don't have to limit it to your department. And is there a particular format those follow? Or? No, not that I'm aware of. I don't know if you all have seen anything consistently that's helpful. Yeah. Just to describe you and describe your ability to teach and right. whatever activities you do. Right, right. Or clinical work as well. Yeah, that's right. Other questions? Okay. So a big difference between the non-tenure track and the tenure track is the campus committee. So the tenure track faculty also go through a campus <coughs> committee on review and uh, or campus PMT committee and the non-tenure track group does not. So otherwise, it's fast. Okay, so um, these are the components of the dossier. And again, this is information that you can find online, and, and you'll have these slides. Um, I'm going to talk about the ones that are in white. Uh, so I, um, I'm not going to talk about the departmental summary letters and recommendations. Those are the letters that come from the committees on review, basically. Um, and the school, um, and the external reviews of the peer evaluations, and then the department and the school guidelines. Those you just print out and stick in your dossier. So, okay. So, appointment history form. You probably can't read this, and I'm sorry about that. So, this is a standard form, and uh, you are asked to indicate for each of your years of appointment what percentage of effort was dedicated to different activities, um, teaching, service, and research. Um, one of the things, well, yeah. So there's a couple of important things to think about this. Um, for a lot of people, their initial appointment letter doesn't distinguish what percentage of time they're supposed to be doing each of these activities, maybe for everybody, I'm guessing, or almost everybody. Um, and so, I remember doing this form and I thought, I'm just making this up. I don't really know. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think that probably consulting with your department chair and getting some agreement about what percentage of your time is intended to be dedicated to each of these activities is the way to go. Um, the nice thing is it can show if there's changes over time. So, for example, you know, maybe some of you have a position where you're doing more classroom teaching early on, and then you take on more um, administrative or service types of responsibilities within your department, and so you're not doing as much direct teaching of students. Well, then that might be demonstrated as you go through your different years of what it is, you know, what your appointment looked like. Um, the other thing just to keep in mind is that even if you're not planning, even as you're not preparing your dossier right now, um, but if you're planning on going up in three years, it's never too soon to talk to your department chair about what this is supposed to look like. You know, so if you don't know, you might want to go talk to your department chair sooner rather than later and say, you know, look what, you know, how, how would I fill this out now? And, um, and hopefully that meshes with what it is that you feel like you're responsible for. That's one of the Well, there you go. So you're going to hear the real word from a department chair. <laughs> um, other thoughts about that? Okay. Um, the other thing to think about, so um, I think that, you know, some people may feel like, what if it's supposed to be that, what if they're told that they're supposed to be doing only teaching, uh, and they're not really supposed to have any time committed to any other activity? Uh, and I think that that's possible as well. Um, first, just to be reassured if you're in that situation that your chair says you're supposed to be 100% teaching, that that's actually really largely okay, that a non-tenure track position is intended to be focused on one of the three areas, and so, you know, you're not expected to excel in all three areas, or even maybe do a whole lot in all three areas. Um, the other thing is the reality is, I don't know if there are really many positions where everybody isn't doing some service. So I'm hopeful that all the department chairs would be able to say, yes, at least some portion of your time is naturally going to be dedicated to service because we serve on committees and so forth. So um, that was one of the questions that was submitted to that. I gave everybody an opportunity to submit questions over Qualtrics. 
So that was one of the questions, is how do you talk with your department chair about this, you know, what percent FTE you've got for each area. So I would just encourage you to have an honest conversation with them and, um, and you know, try to just present what it is that you're doing and, and talk about it. So I'll let you address that some more. Okay, um, so that initial letter of appointment, I kind of already talked about this, but um, that's really key. I, now, if you're in a situation where you don't have an initial letter of appointment um, that clearly spells out what it is that your primary responsibilities are, that's okay. Um, but in your next annual evaluation, I would encourage you to ask your department chair for a statement of what your responsibilities are. So even if it's not dated from the point, the starting point of your appointment, get it in writing that this is what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And the department chairs shouldn't be surprised to have that question. So um, because that initial letter of appointment or that, you know, that appointment, that indication of what you're supposed to be doing, that is really the basis or that's kind of the standard against which a lot of your work is going to be evaluated. So the committee isn't going to know how much time you're supposed to be teaching spending teaching unless that's stated somewhere. So make sure you get that documented somewhere. Um, this, um, so these are quotes from the collected rules. Um, and I think that, you know, the other thing that it says here, which I already mentioned as well, is that you are really um, expected to have one area of focus. So don't worry if you're not doing lots in teaching research and service good to do just one and to do it well. That's the expectation. Okay. All right. The summary of accomplishments. So this is kind of the meat of the dossier. Uh, and so this is the point where you provide information about what it is that you've done. Um, and um, with the with non-tenure track promotion, um, you really want to focus on your areas of appointment. Uh, so don't worry about having lots to say about research. If that's not part of your responsibility, that's really no problem. Um, and uh, this is, again, the guideline from collected rules. So we want to see sustained achievement um, and evidence of excellence and potential for continued growth. Uh, that last part is really critical because, you know, the idea of promotion is not just you've done a great job and now you're done. The idea of promotion is you've done a great job and we can see that you're going to continue to excel in these ways. And so we want to invest in you and support your continued efforts. So um, talking about kind of what you've been doing and what you're going to continue to do is really important. Okay. Um, and so these are some ideas about teaching. So for the teaching, and when you're writing about um, your activities in teaching, kind of your teaching statement, um, these are some of the things to think about. How can you demonstrate some of these? And, you know, with these summaries of accomplishments, this is not a time to be modest. Um, this is a time to um, really try to take a little bit of time to see what it is that you actually do in your everyday work. Um, I think a lot of people take for granted what they do and People are excellent in the classroom or excellent in a clinic, and of course they are, and um, don't recognize that. So I think for a lot of people this is a little bit harder than they might think to um, really sort of sell what it is that you're doing. You know, put it forward in a way that um, shows how good you are. Uh, for some people it can be really helpful to talk with a trusted colleague. You know, so maybe you have a colleague who knows your work pretty well and who's going to be able to say, you know, yeah, Kristen, you're really excellent at engaging students, and this is what I like about what you do, and you know, I wish I did more of the, you know, more of this that I've seen you do. Um, so talk to somebody else. That might be a way to give you a sense of how to brag a little bit about all the great things that you do. Um, and also, oh yeah, go ahead. Question. So how do you provide evidence of that? I mean, is it student evaluations? I mean, because. When you teach, you don't often have your colleagues watching you teach. So, right. how do you provide evidence of this? Yeah. Without awards, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or so, um, so what I've seen in good dossiers, and you guys can jump in on this too. Um, what I've seen in good dossiers is um, I felt like I'm in the, you know, I'm in the mind of the the 
the faculty member. And so they kind of talked me through what their approach is to teaching, uh, what their philosophy is. There's, in fact, there's kind of specific components. I'll jump ahead to this. But, you know, what their philosophy is, how it is that they engage students, um, you know, even knowing what your goals are um, as an instructor, um, how you approach students, all those things, I think, can be very meaningful. Um, I don't know if that quite answers your question. So it's not the same as an award, but it's, um, I mean, if you were to, if you were going to try to teach someone how to be a good instructor, um, what is it about what you do that you would want them to model? And then talk about doing those things. Um, a lot of it is in communicating your approach to the work that you do. I think that's what helps people evaluate, you know, and see the excellence in it. Follow you guys up Molly, in, in one of the things that we have built in, and you may not know this yet, is that um, <coughs> typically during your first year, first year and a half, you'll ask a uh, faculty member a rank ahead of you to sit in on your class and observe. And you know, any of us would be willing to do that. That's a great way. We've gotten we've gotten lots of letters that um, have come through the dossiers that have been from people who've sat in on people's classes. Mm -hmm and written about uh, what they observe, how they interact with students, and so forth. And so, and I'm, I'm willing to do that since for our department, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, or anybody else that's a, a rank ahead of you. Yeah. Other questions back at How does that work for online classes? Evaluating online classes? Yeah. Do you invite somebody to be a guest in your online class and kind of observe? Yeah, so each mode has a rubric for evaluating online courses. Uh, I think it's quality matters. Is that the right? Thank you, Evan. You're nodding. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know that. And I, for those of you, have you had a class evaluated yeah, from that? So okay, there you go. Show, who was our my mm -hmm. our course builder? Um, she, I just allow her to be an instructor on the course also, so she can just see what came throughout. that they use to evaluate, and you can have, I know some, um, I can't remember who, I think some especially, <coughs> Moses in your department has used that, yeah. uh, not in your program maybe, but so I think someone else in um, TDS has used yeah. that. So, and they evaluate it based on kind of the technology piece of it, um, which is, I think that could be very helpful. Other questions about that? Okay. So, um, as you're writing this section, um, these are the different components that you'll want to include. So, you know, the first part is the narrative. Uh, usually it's maybe a couple of pages long uh, about your philosophy, your teaching philosophy. Um, the next section, the summary of the teaching responsibilities. Um, you know, it is true, like Chris said, you don't want to have huge lengthy narratives that don't give a lot of information. On the other hand, um, a listing of classes may not communicate exactly what you're doing either. So there's some middle ground about in talking about your um, teaching responsibilities. So classes you've developed, other things like that. <laughs> um, and then uh, summary, summary of teaching and training achievements. Um, and this can be awards, but it can also be things that you've done to enhance your skills as an instructor. So, um, so participating in the campus writing program, um, going to Wakanzi would be something that you would put in there, um, participating in celebration of teaching, those kinds of things. Uh, and then the summary of the teaching or training evaluations you'll want to include there. Um, in, I don't know, as you all think in the dossiers that I've seen, they include the numbers as well as some um, narratives. Uh, you have to you know, select them carefully. You don't need tons of narratives. Yeah. Um, Quotes from students. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just a couple, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, and then, of course, evaluation table. 
And then the peer reviews. So two is probably good, no more than four. I don't know if I've ever seen more than just a couple. Yeah, okay. Sometimes they use, yeah. sometimes they use uh, letters from uh, former students who are already working in the field or mm -hmm. something like They might be good, some kind of uh, mm -hmm. review of your really uh, involvement in the creation of their future, maybe. Yeah. Which will uh, reflect your education mm -hmm. philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. If you have a special connection with a student or a student who... Or in the field, because we are already in professional fields, and we have connection all, all the time, because we go to the hospital, and everything else, and still, we are, after the graduation, we are still connected somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so, summary of accomplishments in clinical care. Uh, and so these are some of the things to keep in mind that you would want to demonstrate if you were talking about excellence in clinical care. Um, you know, essentially, promotion is uh, based on um, recognizing people who are seen as leaders uh, and who are role models or resources for students and for other people. Um, you know, some of the things that you might think about uh, for this would be you know, what state or national organizations do you serve on because of your applied expertise? Um, and I know for a lot of you, there's sort of this clinical and teaching overlap quite a bit. Uh, so you might think about that. Um, for people who are in clinics, um, you know, you could provide information about the patients that you serve. And are they coming from long distances to see you in particular to get care in your clinic? Does your clinic or the one you're affiliated with or that you oversee, does it have a reputation um, that's demonstrated in ways like that by the number of patients you serve or, or where they come from? Um, I also think it could be useful to talk about um, involvement with other healthcare services. So uh, for those clinics that have interactions with other disciplines, I think that that's worth mentioning too. Um, the structure for the summary of accomplishments for clinical service is really pretty similar to what you would do for teaching. Um, so again, the clinical service philosophy, uh, thinking about your clinical approach to dealing with patients and integrating students for most of you who are in clinical settings, uh, how you integrate students uh, in seeing patients, uh, and that kind of overlap between the clinical work and the teaching. Um, a summary of the responsibilities that clinical <coughs> services provided, uh, and then um, other indices of achievements. So um, maybe some of you are doing presentations about the clinic that you all run. Uh, that's something that would be worth mentioning here. Um, I'm to think. Uh, and then peer reviews or letters of support can be helpful as well. Uh, and then for service, um, I think that um, it is important to talk about service activities uh, and I've seen some dossiers that just include again kind of a listing of service activities, but that's not all that informative, so you don't want to give the committees and everybody tons to read, but a little bit of narrative to put it in context I think would be helpful. Um, ideally you're looking for service opportunities that um, demonstrate your expertise, you know, so whether that's in a professional organization that is meaningful to you or um, doing campus activities uh, related to teaching, uh, you know, something that kind of shows what it is that, uh, that matters to you. Um, and I think trying to find, again with the idea of not being modest, um, trying to find some way to communicate why is it you're a good person to have this service responsibility relative to others. So um, what is it about your expertise that makes you a good fit for this role? Uh, and you know, like we tell our students, um, you know, when stu we're talking to students about getting ready to go out in the job market, it's not just about membership, it's also about leadership. So the same thing sort of applies to us as well. So if there's something that you can say about your service activities that demonstrates you taking the initiative in some way, even if you're not the chair of a committee or whatever, 
um, that's a good thing to include. Okay. Um, I included this. There are, although I don't think we have any in our school, but um, it is possible to have a non tenure track research equipment, and they exist all over campus. So I just put this in here for reference in case people need it. So if you're not doing any research, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, yeah, if you are doing some, certainly talk about it and how that integrates with your other primary responsibilities. I think that would be helpful. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So, thanks for preparing for promotion. Start today. I think that's the most important thing, um, that it really is a process. You don't want to be thinking about all the things that you're doing uh, and how they're helpful for getting promoted just when you're doing a dossier. Uh, if you want to think about it along the way, it'll make your lives much easier. Um, so, uh, these, this is some of the advice that I got uh, when I started. So, one, keep a file of important documents. If you don't have one already, I just had a file folder in my drawer, and whenever anything came across that seemed meaningful, I would just drop it in there, um, and then go back later and figure out if it actually was worth keeping or not. Uh, but keep keep things. Uh, keep copies of everything, uh, so that way you can easily go back to it. Um, keep your CV current. Probably most of you do that already, uh, but <coughs> never hurts to make sure you just keep it updated as you go. Um, seek regular feedback. I think that this is really key. You know, your department colleagues, your department chair, me, we all want to see you get promoted. We want to see, and that's a sign that you're being successful in your jobs, uh, and we all want that. So make sure you're talking to people regularly, uh, not just with your annual evaluations with your chairs, but um, if you have questions, find people that you can ask about, you know, what else should I be doing right um, it also doesn't hurt to talk to people outside of the school if you have connections in state or national associations, um, especially some of our departments have, you know, the like sciences has a really diverse group of professionals, and so uh, talk to other people in your discipline about what it is that you could be doing to, um, to you know, uh, be demonstrating your expertise. Um, and kind of related to that, uh, try to stay connected in your field. I think it's very easy. I know I find it very easy to kind of be focused on my work life here and to think a little bit less about staying connected nationally. Uh, but it is really important to do that and it's pretty easy to do. You know, most associations are happy to have someone who's willing to do some work. So um, if you're able to find a little time to attend a conference or, or participate in activities uh, on, at the state or national level, I think that's a great thing to do. And I should say too, um, being strategic about your involvement is also really critical. So um, I've seen people who are really successful, you know, their research faculty and all of their volunteer activities are related to their interest in research. And it's sort of, their service activities essentially help advance their research mission. So that's not always easy to do, but um, to the extent that it's possible, maybe there's campus committees that you could be involved in that already draw on what you're interested in, look for those first. Um, in terms of your dossier specifically, probably one of the most important things is to not assume that your accomplishments are obvious to other people. Um, my guess is for all of us, our accomplishments probably aren't even obvious to most of our peers and our departments. Um, you know, the department chairs do have a chance to see what everyone's doing, but, uh, but it's hard to keep up. I mean, everybody does a lot. So um, when you're communicating in your narrative about what is it you're doing, um, don't assume that people already understand uh, all the stuff that you've done. You've really got to put it out there. Um, emphasize your strengths, that's obvious. Um, I talked a little bit about this idea of linking what you've done and what you're doing with the future. Uh, and I think that that's important. Um, showing how you've contributed and how you continue to contribute, I think, is um, it's key. Uh, and the last two are about service. Um, do you guys have questions for me? Um, are you, are yeah. you going to talk about eligibility?
eligibility or is anyone going to talk about eligibility? No. Fire away. I mean, when you're eligible third year, you're eligible fifth year. But yeah. Uh, so okay. that's a great question. Um, yes. So you are eligible. I actually have to go back and take a look at our guidelines. Um, our says three years. I think it was three, 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 five. At, at whatever position you are, before the next step up. Yep. Yeah. That's right. I hope so. That's what we're going to do. No, no, you're right. <laughs> I'm pulling out my back and policy manual right here. Thank you very much. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle, uh, who will talk us through some things as well. Good. I'm going to start with a personal uh, perspective and not just a chair perspective. I've worked here for now a little while, and about half of my career, we didn't have any promotion. And so it was incredibly meaningful to me when we did. Um, it, it meant a lot to me. With this process, there is no campus committee. Okay? And the campus committee in the regular tenure process is often where the rubber meets the road. Okay? Because these people in the school know you and often that's where problems occur. I shouldn't say problems, that's where real strenuous judgment occurs. I think this pro process needs to be very neat. And so I encourage the committee, I encourage chairs, future committee members to make this a rigorous, meaningful process. It cannot just be a rubber stamp um, from the beginning. And unfortunately without a a campus committee on um, a school that's relatively small like ours, I think there's a, a real danger to people just sort of spending their five years and expecting to go up um, and pass. The tenure process is definitely not like that, and I have a huge respect for the tenure and promotion process. And that leads to the idea of uh, yearly evaluations. Um, for the for the tenure process as a chair, we need to give people very specific, you know, evaluation if they're on target. Um, you can't just say, you're doing great, you're doing great, you're doing great, and then them not get a positive letter from you. You can't do that. Um, likewise, you need to be evaluated well by your department chair. And I think that that's sometimes where the teaching or the non-tenure track faculty that tends to kind of fall apart a little bit. So you should have the expectation that you're given good information. Um, so, okay. Um, I really encourage you all to look at the university collected rules and regulations. It's one page where it talks about non-tenure track appointments and promotion, and it's chock full of really, really good information. I also encourage you to look at the SHP um, promotion document. It's not just one page, but it's still really, really full of, of very good information. I want to hit some highlights of that. Um, uh, so, um, Going up for promotion can't be demanded of a non-tenure track person. Okay? So it's not like when you're hired, and you're expected to go up in five or six years or whatever, and if you fail, you're out. You can't, they can't do that. It says that in the collective rules. Um, so, and if you fail, you can't be fired because you don't get promoted. Does that, does that make sure? I'm going to butcher this up. That's okay. um, you should only be judged on your primary area of appointment. So um, that keeps a department chair from being abusive to a non-tenure track person. I think that's the reason for that. I can't hire someone and not give them tenure and expect them to have a, a teaching agenda, a, a service agenda, and a research agenda that's of significance in all three years. I can't do that as a chair, and it shouldn't be expected. The percent workload stuff is really, really, really important. And um, it's something that I, I don't, I am 
I did not do a good job of that right in the beginning. I didn't understand the, the necessity of it, but it's really important. And for the tenured folks, that's typical. They get that, but for the non-tenure track people, it's often um, not explicitly stated. Because another thing it says in the collective rules and regulations is your role in the department should be explicitly stated. And that often takes the, uh, takes the role of your yearly discussion of what you're going to be doing and how that breaks into um, the percentages. The, can you flip back to that, that form that you have, the history yep. form? This, this is really interesting because the history form has many more columns, not many more, a couple more, than the tenure track. Tenure track's relatively simple as far as these percentages goes. It says teaching, research, and service. For the non-tenure track, there is a percentage in traditional teaching, percentage in other teaching, percentage in traditional service, percentages in other service, and percentages in extension between them. So there is much more detail there, and if it becomes time to fill out this, this page, and you don't have that information, it's creative writing, and you, it's really, really difficult to capture that. Another thing about this form that's really, I'm glad you blew it up this far. Can you go to the top of the form? Did you just download this form recently? Uh, yes. Okay, I downloaded the form today, mm -hmm. and it's not uncommon for these dates to be wrong. Mm -hmm. My dates are the same as these dates on here. This is for people who are going to be going up in September. This is two years old. Yeah. Okay? So the, the, if you go up in September of 2000. 15, you're going up for the year 1516. Okay? So that date at the top needs to be changed. This is a Word document, and it is that years as of, that's 16 also. Okay? The end of your appointment is 16. So your fifth year is this year. That's something that people, a lot of people don't understand. So you could update your document throughout the year, but your your fifth year is your application year. You don't have to have five years behind you. Is that clear? Okay, that's something that was surprising to, to, to me. So that's something to know. Um, so you meet with your department chair and get those specific percentages, and that should be a discussion um, that you have planning for the next year. I, we're on contract, but most of y'all probably going to sign what you would feel would be a, a formal contract. But when you you need to have some documentation about what you're doing next year, and that documentation should be in percentages in these columns. Okay, I can't emphasize enough. And I've spent a ton of time and effort kind of making sense of that with our own department. Okay? So that, that's an absolute from a, from a department chair that you need to do. Um, I've rewritten all of our letters of initial appointment just because they weren't, we didn't have it. Um, and when we did, it didn't cover this. So I, you know, I, as a chair, I dated, I wasn't fishy about it, I dated it this year, and I said, in lieu of your initial appointment, which did not have these this percentage breakdown. This is what you were hired to do, okay, um, with those percentages. Um, oh, okay. And I might I don't want to step on what you guys are talking about, but the idea that to be promoted, and if you read the SHP guidelines, it's pretty clear. It isn't just about getting great student evaluations. Okay, it's about at the associate of full level, having a reputation for excellence beyond this campus. And that's really important. And that doesn't happen by accident. Okay? If you're working hard, putting out your fires, teaching great classes, getting great student evaluations, that is in this campus. Okay? So it's important that you establish a reputation beyond this campus. In some examples of that, uh, just from our own department, Teresa Bridewell was selected to write questions for our national PT board exam. Okay? That's, a, Nash, that's a, a reputation beyond the campus at a regional or national level. Dana Martin is, uh, did a presentation at a national scientific conference on a clinical education topic. Um, Jeff Krug did a, 
uh, a presentation at our national scientific conference on integrating our free clinic into our curriculum. Okay? Those things won't happen naturally, but you've got to think about them when you're building your uh, uh, dossier, okay? when you're building your experience. Things that you might not occur to you to do, you have to do. And I think that one of the big differences between, I won't, I'm almost done, I promise, um, with, with evaluation and the non-tenure track and the evaluation at the, the, the tenure track level is often promotion isn't really a topic that's discussed in the non-tenure track chair evaluation. And you really, it can be. Okay, if you're interested in someday going to promotion, you don't have to, remember, but if you are interested, make that a topic of your discussion. Am I on target? Do you, you know, how am I doing? Can, you can ask for more formal information from the chair. So that's, that's, um, that's very, very important. So my wrap-up is you've got to get your percent efforts documented. Um, and be conscious of what you need to do to develop a reputation beyond the campus level. Those would be my two big takeaways. You guys have questions for Kyle? Mm -hmm. I'm a little confused about the dates on here. So you said that the in parentheses where it says 831-14, that will be 831-16 if someone is submitting next in September. Yeah, let me see something. And and so that first year in the graph would be 2014-2015. Yeah. 2015-2016. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the history form at the top should be of the academic year that you're applying for. Um, the August of 31, so that would be the end of your appointment for 16. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So typically yeah. appointments run from September 1st to August 30th, right? 31st. 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 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 days in August? 31. 31. 31st. <laughs> yeah, 31. So it would be, so be August 31st. So then in the in the graph, it'd be the year previous to that, not the year that you're going up for, but you'd be detailing the years previous to that? Is yeah, that I think, you know, it's hard That's to right. know. Yeah, I, they want to know what your appointments have been historically. Okay. Right, thank you. Yes. Right, because the year, because your dossier is kind of under review during that year 15 to 16, right. so you're not putting your percent effort in there, that yeah. chart. Okay. Right, you're doing for the previous. I think that's confusing every time. Yeah. From, from what you just said, making sure that I understand. So let's say that I'm not the greatest teacher, but I'm like some big time person in the, the field that I'm in. That would weigh more towards going up for an associate or a full than. No, I wouldn't say more. And you guys, I, I'm talking about from a chair perspective. You guys give them a committee perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but from a chair perspective, I, you know, I don't think it's reasonable to expect to be promoted if you are not a good teacher. Right. Now, what is a good teacher? A teacher isn't necessarily, the, the sum total of your evaluation of a good teacher is not your student uh, uh, evaluations. Student evaluations should be one portion of your judgment, at, that's a student satisfaction rate, but you need to have other evaluations of your teaching quality that you're, you're doing throughout your, um, that would be peer review, that would be other things. Can we give okay. some more concrete examples of that? Sure, um, please. So the, um, the committee has actually made rubrics that come directly from the guidelines, mm -hmm. um, because some of us need structure. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, under the rubric for associate teaching professor, for example, the things under teaching specifically say candidate demonstrates exceptional teaching, i.e. teaching evals, serves as mentor to students, serves as role model to new faculty, demonstrates evidence of promoting professional growth of students, demonstrates excellent reputation as teacher in, in institution and region, 
um, integrates original research and primary work into teaching, and the teaching reflects current knowledge and teaching methods. And those are directly out of the guidelines. So, this is what we look at when we look at those things. And so it's beyond, like Kyle yeah. said, it's beyond just the teaching, right. the, the student teaching class. And the PT department has taken the SHP uh, stuff and boiled it down into a format a lot like yours. It's, it's just a little expanded. That's why people who don't have department level um, expectations, I think, are really at a disadvantage if they don't have that document. So we have a document very similar to that. But you know, and, and another thing, like the the mentorship, um, you might not accidentally mentor new, another faculty member going up for promote, you know, during your first five years. But if you know you have to, then you can do a better job documenting that. But um, your your regional reputation is important, but it doesn't override the quality of your teaching. Did I answer it? Yeah. I'm taking a long time. It's almost just it's almost the flip side of that. A lot of people feel like I'm a great teacher, I get because I get great student evaluations, I'm set. Well no, you're really not set. There, there are other areas where you have to document. And when it comes time to document in the Vidasi, you think, oh geez, I don't think I mentored another. I sure could have, but I didn't. Or man, if I would have just taken that poster to a meeting that would work, you know? So just be conscious of it. Not just that we don't have separate departmental guidelines, but we, we do follow the uh, SHP guidelines. Mm -hmm. And so I think your rubric is from those. Yes, right. exactly. Right. And, you know, as a chair, what I'm looking for in part is engagement. And so you want to make sure that someone's doing the job that you hired them for, for your department, first and foremost but that you stay engaged so that you're bringing the value added to your, your teaching or your primary responsibility and representing your department outside of just the walls of Missouri. Mm -hmm. Now I can't emphasize enough that that doesn't necessarily just accidentally happen. You have to make that happen. Yeah. It's easy, it's so hard. You're teaching your classes, you're swamped, you, you get from day to day to day, and then it's the summer. And then it's a little easier, and then summer school starts, and it starts again. You don't necessarily fall into satisfying all the parts of the group. If you want, Stephanie, we could send these to you and post them. That would be great. Yeah. That would be great. So I don't know, Mark and Julie, if you all want to talk from the committee perspective of you know sort of do's and don'ts and wisdom and all that good stuff. Well, I, a lot of what Kyle said does uh, hold true for us as well. Um, one of the main comments we get a lot is, we need to hear more about what you're doing. Not so much that we need to hear repetition about what you're doing, but to your board. I mean, this is your opportunity to say, this is why I deserve to be promoted. Um, and it's, I know for whatever reason, that at this level of academia, that has a hard, it's a hard time for some people. Not all, but <laughs> it's, for a lot of people, it's hard to do. Um, but uh, quite often we we have to say, you know, you, you, it's obvious that you're doing it, but we need to see what you're doing and how you're doing it, and give us some examples about these these areas. Uh, we know they're there. We know we, we a lot of these uh, Tazis we see. We know the folks who are who are coming through. Um, and like like uh, Chris said, more is not necessarily better. It's it's being uh, hitting all the categories and doing a thorough job of it, but we don't need to hear it time and time and time again. So that's one of the big things that we often tell people. Generally what happens um, at the, the school committee level is we get however many dossiers we get during that period in, and then if any of us are in the department of the candidate, then we aren't on the, the committee specifically. We'll still review the dossier, but we're not going to be a primary or secondary reviewer. So then we appoint a primary and secondary reviewer of each who do the primary and secondary. <laughs> <laughs> and, but everybody reads them and, and, and makes notes and, and then we come back and talk about them. And, and almost always what happens if there's somebody on the committee who's in the department, if somebody who's up for promotion, maybe I reviewed it and I'll say, well, I don't see anything that, that reflects 
X, and the other person in the, in, on the committee will say, oh my gosh, well, they do this and this and this and this and all of these things that actually meet that criteria. And I'm like, but it's not. You know, and I think that what happens is we all get, we're all so busy and we all do so much that we, we don't even realize what we're doing or how it fits sometimes necessarily. So I think the idea to start that from the very beginning and through the year and as you're doing things, you know, um, keeping track of those kinds of things is going to make that a lot easier than, oh, it's been three years, I'm going to go ahead and go up for promotion. Now let me, let me think back and try to remember everything. That's really challenging. But we've never had a dossier that we haven't had to send back for some degree of um, revision. Yeah, something. Something add this, we need to hear from Which is this, okay. This. But sometimes it's kind of a lot. And we hate doing that because we know everybody's on a time crunch. So typically we try to give oh gosh, two to three weeks. By the time we review it to do the revision, so that it has time to go to the dean. Um, that they're... That's assuming that we get the dossiers on time, <laughs> which we did accept late dossiers this year, and we're not going to do that again. So if they're not in by the deadline, we're not going to review them. It really, it was really stressful this year to get through. There were a couple things that were missing that were really important. <laughs> Plus, I think with the provost office firm timeline now, yeah. You know, we're not going to be able to do that. And I think before we could get the materials to the provost office later, and that would be fine, but starting this coming year, we can't do that any longer. So. One recommendation mm -hmm. is that if you know somebody that's in your department that has already gone through this process, talk to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, uh, we've gotten some really, really strong dossiers um, one of the, the years that I've been on this committee. Um, just some ones you look at going, man, I wish I did half of this. <laughs> so um, if there's somebody in your department who's already gone through this, Ask to see their boss. And I'm, I'm guessing I'm going to toot your horn, Teresa, because uh, I was first reviewer on hers, and it was like, wow. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if anybody, I, I, you know. And it's, that makes it even so much weirder that she's going to lose her job. Not like Yes. After it goes to the provost, what's the timeline? Um, yeah. That's a good question. It's, you know, it's pretty variable. Um, it seems to take quite a while. Uh, yeah, I don't have a better answer than that. No, 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 no. It's about months, three, months, three, three, three to four months. months. Yeah. Depending, they are not on vacation or something. <laughs> and look what happened. Happened before. Before the end of the appointment period. Yes. Do they have it back much before that? I think they do. I'm kind of my question last year. It was like July. July. Yeah, it was yeah. early August. Yeah. It was like July. Okay, there you go. It was July last year. Okay. So, and the deadline was about the same. We got them in March. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And you can update your dossier as the year goes on. You right? can. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's so, why it's this year, the entire year. So if you want to update your dossier, the thing to do would be to send the materials to Nicole White. And then she keeps a, as part of my office, she keeps the full dossier. Uh, and then she will be sure to get the materials to wherever it is in review, basically, to kind of catch up with your dossiers as they're out there and get the materials submitted. So, yeah, that can happen because it can, yeah, it can be added throughout the year. That's right. I, think, I was thinking it would be helpful, like, for me, the piece that was like, well, how do you get that regional? Recognition, like I hear about a client who would present at a conference or something. Right? So maybe it's like you can get invited to guest lecture at other universities and stuff. That's that region. That's yeah. yeah. But okay, so I need yeah. help. If anybody can know somebody, somebody help. I mean, I think it would be helpful because I, you know, how do you establish those networks to get asked? Well, one thing for sure is try Wakanzi. Yeah. yeah. It's a great place to get started. Mm -hmm. Because Wakanzi is a, they um, often enable people to present. And you don't have to, I mean, they, they, they rope you into presenting. Well, Wakanzi is a national teaching conference. And you've presented at a national teaching conference. So, a fairly low hanging fruit, but it's, a, it's still. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that as far as, you know, it's definitely, I think, more cloud.
about for you to have been an invited speaker at a convention, but it's hard to get your foot in the door if people don't know you. So being willing to speak at conventions, even you know, as when call for papers go out, go ahead and put those proposals in. I think um, when committees are, or convention committee, planning committees are trying to decide who their invited speakers should be, they look back to the past presenters of previous years, and it's based on the input evaluations that we get from those conventions that we say, oh, then those people would want to invite back mm -hmm. if they had successful. In slanting your um, service as a teaching thing can also help too. I mean, if, if you're, you're like um, Teresa, part of her service is to write board. I know this is, I mean, write board exam questions for the national. I mean, that was something she was selected to do and shows a national reputation. Demonstrates that our, our board exam folks don't have good judgment, but it's still. <laughs> 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 but I think also you don't necessarily have to present just on teaching. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you have topics of interest that aren't yeah. specifically about teaching, but you could present on ethics or right. yeah, right. So and there's right and there's local conferences yeah. that I think are regional conferences, yeah. but they're run locally. Mm -hmm. uh, you, that would be a great thing. Okay. Uh, also for uh, programs who are. Uh, accredited by national uh, accreditation bodies, being a site visitor and things like that, that's very important because you are really certified to be able to yep. be expert on that field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Did you have a question? Too? Well, I had a question. How much, you know, I had a non tenure track appointment before I got this non tenure track appointment. Does, how much does your previous work play into when you're going up? I mean, does it does it weigh into it, or does it not, or how does that work? You guys know? I think from our point of view, it, it, it all applies. Okay. I mean, it's just, it, especially it's been, if you're showing me you know, progress and, <coughs> and uh, growth and so forth, I you know, you would definitely take that into consideration. Are you talking about your adjunct appointment? No, prior I'm talking about prior? my extension work. Well, mm -hmm. within the university? Yeah. Oh well, yeah, yeah, that's important. Okay. Yeah. And that might sway you from the three to five years. Maybe you could yeah. apply early. Right. Yeah. And then I think in your statement you could talk about, you know, what you did there. I mean, it could be sort of a right the whole story. You don't just talk about your however many years here, but pull it all together. Okay. okay. And just knowing some of what Molly's done, can you use like what what she's done previously as sort of this is why I'm such a good teacher because I have all this experience and you know, absolutely it's really yeah, because it's true, true right? right? And it's it's yeah. part of your uh, of your yeah. years. Yeah. 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 Okay. Absolutely. Other questions? Now I have a question. <laughs> uh, in previous years we have different colors of the dossier. Different colors? Yeah. Blue or black or black and blue, and we had a little problem a few years back with it. Is that? I have no idea. I have. I I don't know. No. Pick your color. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No You're talking about the no presentation sentence. of it, no. sort of the the the, 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 the folder. folder and everything. The folder. Oh, I think as long as it looks professional, you know. Because well, we have that change. The I, I mentioned this at the faculty meeting. Is that it's. It's the rank, then the position, then the professor. So it's associate yep. teaching professor, assistant teaching professor, assistant clinical. So the assistant of the associate comes first, <coughs> right. then the position, then the, the, the rank. So, yeah. and, okay. and that's a lot of us had that backwards. Yeah. 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 And our initial appointments, I think it was that either way. Was and mine was the same way. Mm -hmm. so. There was one other question we haven't uh, covered yet in the survey that I sent out. So someone asked. Then we talk about electronic dossiers. Advantages, disadvantages, use it, MU, and elsewhere. Um, so, uh, so you've probably heard there's discussion about uh, kind of a, I don't know what this what system is called, but basically it's like a Vita where you would input all of your information into it, and then it would automatically populate a dossier. Um, 
So as far as I know, I'm actually honestly not directly involved in this. I don't know if you all are. Janet's been, Janet Parker's been kind of taking the lead for SHP on this. Um, and I think it seems to me we're at least a year away from anything like that. Um, you know, I, from my point of view, and you all have had a chance, I'll kind of just think about this some. I think the advantage is it sounds kind of nice to be able to just put all your information in and have it populate forms. Um, the concern that I would have, not knowing too much about this particular system that's being looked at, is um, how is it going to work for non-tenure track faculty? I mean, I think that the way that it might work for tenure track faculty is a little bit more obvious in the sense that you know it's going to have a lot of those research-related metrics. Um, but how it would work for non-tenure track dossiers, I just don't know. Um, so that would be that would be a concern for me. You know, the nice thing as I see it about this process is that we really have a hand of faculty in the school in what this process looks like um, and what we expect in the dossiers. So I feel like I don't know. Even if we have this online system, if we don't like the way that it works, we'll find a way to make sure that the materials that demonstrate what it is that you need that matter are included in your dossier. Well, you always want the narrative component. Yeah. yeah. I can see you producing a CV. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I think that's what it does, but it tracks research over time so that if you have yeah. something in press, it makes sure that right. you are submitted, that you follow through, things like that. But I don't really see it as being, well, from what I've heard about it, what I've heard about it, it really is for some small research. I think so. That's what my understanding too, Pat. And then for these people going up next year, how many paper copies do they need? Because I think that's always just a question. No, that's right. Seven. So, one second. I think seven or eight. It's a bunch. Yeah, it's a bunch. I'm sorry, we're going to pull along these guys. Yeah, um, I think we just need. Shoot, I'm sorry about that. I'll send an email. I could guess, but I don't want to. I think that's it. Well, seven. 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 I would say about that though, it, it, at the committee on review level where it's in your department, it's only three. Three is probably enough because it's probably going to get major revisions before you print more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, initially, maybe three. Right. Five. Five. And I think Nicole tries to make copies and, yeah. It's not an original work of art. You know what I mean? So look at your, and you've already said this, look at your other people in your departments and, and yeah. follow, follow us successfully. <coughs> yep. It's, it's sort of, it's not a time to like show your creative skills. It's, it's really much more of a template. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Why don't you do one type of Okay. Well, thank you all. I think we're, we maybe can stay here for a few more minutes. Maybe we'll have questions. And then our